Uh, tonight we are here to discuss the role of trade unions in rebuilding the state and society. So welcome to this, the sixth in the series of IAR Zoom discussions. I'm pleased to say that we've got just over 200 registered, so welcome to you all. My name is Carolyn Jones. I am the Director of the Institute of Employment Rights and I'm proud to be chairing this event tonight. We are a network of academics, lawyers and trade unionists and we are fighting for three simple things. For improved employment rights from day one of employment for all workers, regardless of their employment status. For stronger rights and protections for trade unions so they can reach, represent and support workers thereby helping to shift the balance of power in the workplace. And third, for a central role for trade unions in determining how industry, workplaces and the economy should be run. For backup reading, I'd like to give a particular plug for IER's 2016 Manifesto for Labour Law that offered um, what John MacDonald referred to as a blueprint for the radical reform of UK labour law. And it's well worth a read and it's there on our website. Our theme tonight focuses on mm. the third of our three major demands, and that is on uh, the role of trade unions in building a better future and a bigger role for the state kind of background in the 1980s as i'm sure you all know thatcher declared the state and society dead and the free market in charge um privatization fragmentation deregulation has been the preferred route ever since then the trade unions representing on our panel tonight have each battled against that shift and now COVID-19 has exposed to the wider public how government policies have critically undermined our ability to respond in a crisis. There's an inability of the estate to quickly and effectively produce PPE, failure of the state to put in place test, trace and isolate plans, failure of the state to deliver on the needs of the NHS and the care sector, and the state's continual inability to set forth enforcement agencies that can effectively monitor and enforce health and safety issues at work. So COVID-19 has exposed and highlighted what unions have been saying for years. The state's not fit for purpose, and we need a state machinery that is well-resourced, trained, efficient, and delivering the many services that the public needs and expects in a civilised society. Well, I'm not going to say any more. I think everybody has joined us who are trying to get in. Our speakers tonight can speak with authority and more eloquently than me, and our time is short. But do feel free to post questions and comments in the chat box. And um, we'll do our best with the help of Sarah Glanister and James Harrison to put your issues to the speakers. So talking to speakers, we have a great lineup tonight and I'll introduce them as we go through the evening. And first up is Dave Ward. Welcome, Dave. Dave is the General Secretary of the CWU. Uh, the fight for a New Deal for Britain workers has been a central theme of the Communication Workers Union's wider campaign. Um, and your fight, Dave, against privatisation of postal services most recently and against further breakup of the post office is ongoing. What role then do you see for the state in the post and communications in the future, uh, Dave? OK, thanks, Cad, and uh, hi, everybody. And it's great to be uh, reconnected with the Institute and all the panellists here tonight and everybody who, who's watching. Um, I thought a good scene setter for my contribution would be to make an initial response to Boris Johnson's uh, much trailed launch today of a new deal for Britain. And I suppose, first of all, uh, it wasn't the Roosevelt inspired new deal that was trailed that we heard today. Uh, at best, it was intervention on the edges. At worst, there is no way that what they're proposing is going to deal with the scale of the crisis we face economically uh, and the potential for mass unemployment. Uh, secondly, it certainly wasn't the New Deal that we've been campaigning for, uh, for workers. There was nothing in it that changed or shifted the balance of forces in the world of work. There was nothing in it that tackled the reality that the economy, that we see today is founded uh, in terms of work 
on the basis of insecure employment models, uh, insecure work, low pay, low productivity. So, you know, this wasn't the new deal that we wanted and it's up to us now to campaign and fight for the one that we really need. I think what the government has failed to address is that the crisis that we're dealing with is not just a public health crisis. It's a crisis that's come about as a result of decades of structural imbalance in the economy, um, of structural imbalance in the power structures of society. And I suppose the key question that we face as a labour movement, as always, is what are we going to do about it? Well, I, I want to put a bit of context to that in terms of the postal and telecommunications industry. Uh, and I want to talk about three things and three areas where we represent members, where we will take this fight forward and we will take our own solutions to some of these problems forward. The first one is in the rollout of gigabit uh, broadband uh, for the UK. This, if done properly, will have a massive economic benefit uh, for the whole of the UK. It, it would level up, uh, it would start to give opportunities to build a northern powerhouse uh, to make sure that the plans that Labour put forward, I can see John on there, um, I mean that was a radical new deal. Rolling out free broadband, organised by the government, ultimately renationalising bits of BT and making sure that procurement in doing that, the conditions, set standards of good employment, uh, set standards for proper training for engineers and ultimately made sure that everyone, it wasn't just the hardest to reach areas, some of the towns in the Midlands and up north at the moment are not anywhere near the level of connectivity that we need. Uh, we are lagging behind the whole of the world. In the UK at the moment, we, we've got gigabit moving at about 14.5% coverage. And places like Japan and Korea, South Korea, are on 98 and 99% respectively. So it is the style that we need with Labour, but we're going to fight for that policy with the industry, with the government. We're going to lobby for all of those things. Secondly, you may have seen um, recently that Royal Mail tried to reduce the universal service as, as a temporary measure, they said, but it was quite clear that it was a permanent measure uh, that they wanted to do that in response to sickness absence levels uh, through the pandemic and you know we fought against that and within a couple of days uh, we were able to ultimately remove the CEO of Royal Mail, he left um, and we've just gone into back with the new CEO and the new chairman of the company uh, and we're talking to them about a completely different approach to how you expand the USO and more importantly how you use the greatest asset, which is the people, to be part of the well-being of society, postal workers, go to every uh, street, village, town, rural area, every single day. Uh, and we want to expand the products that go for the USO. So we've got plans for that, and our job is to fight for that with the company, change their strategy. Uh, we want to deliver parcels. Uh, of course we want to do that. We want to do much more. And we've got the infrastructure to do it and the government should be using that infrastructure to support small businesses in a better way and we are going to put the arguments forward to do that. Finally, um, it's about the post office and the role of the post office. Not everybody recognises that actually what happened with the government was not just that they privatised um, Royal Mail but they actually split the post office from Royal Mail. It's the only postal service in the world where the retail arm is split from its operational arm and we would like to see that come back together and we are going to campaign for that and talk to the two companies because it actually makes sense um, but we want to see the post office as the hub of the high street recovery we've put that forward to the government uh, we want to see it turned into a post bank where we can start to end financial uh, exclusion and we can create 
a proper high street where and I've talked to Mark about this as well, where we can join up and create uh, a recovery in a different way where work is centered on a high street around a post office. Uh, and we wanna take those ideas forward. I'll finish on this. For me, this is a, a combination of working with employers who wanna work with trade unions. It's also about us using our industrial muscle to change the position of some of the employers who are gonna take advantage of this pandemic. And it's about us fighting for our own new deal. We've got to set that deal out there, what it means, and trade unions have got to come together and fight for the real new deal that's going to move the country forward. Thanks. Thanks very much for that, Dave. Um, very precise, on time, well done, very disciplined. Um, I know that you've been battling not only against the employers and the state, but also against the anti-trade union legislation that's been used against you in the past too, which is just another method of trying to stop you in your campaign and track. So uh, thank you for that overview. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. Uh, Mark is the General Secretary of the uh, PCS. Um, uh, you've seen your fair share, Mark, of cuts, of pay freezes and of attacks on the ability of your union to uh, organise um, in your workplaces. From what you're seeing, what departments of state are you having to protect from current and future attacks and how is your union responding, Mark? So, uh, well, well, good evening to everyone and thanks for those who are uh, giving up their time to watch. Um, always love listening to Dave Ward, and, and I think Dave has, has indicated some of the really big issues that we as a movement need to be thinking about moving forward. What I wanted to talk about is, is illustrating the experience of what's happened in the civil service, is to draw out the attacks on workers, but how those attacks on workers have also accompanied, been accompanied by attacks on the public whom we serve to illustrate what austerity has done and why given there's a huge amount the government may now come looking for the public sector to pay for how they've dealt with the coronavirus pandemic, gives us a bit of an indication as to what we need to fight for or, or, or be prepared to fight for in the period ahead. So I'm gonna take two government departments to illustrate the point, which are basically the DWP and HMRC. So they make up the bulk of the civil service. Um, and in both departments, since 2008, we have seen over 50,000 jobs go. So when we had the financial crisis back a decade ago, there were 50,000 more workers in the DWP than there are now. We've seen during the COVID crisis, universal credit claims increase exponentially to 2.6 million. So they increased by tenfold on any given day during the height of the pandemic, yet we have 50,000 less workers able to deal with the universal credit claims. In the tax offices, we've also seen 50,000 workers go. Now the tax offices are tasked with delivering the job retention scheme. They also have to ensure that we collect the money that keeps our public services going. Uh, and yet under austerity, the government has slashed massively the resources it puts into chasing down tax evasion and tax avoidance to a record low. Yet in the DWP, it has increased massively a reduced overall resource into chasing down benefit fraud. Now, these are important concepts because I think they tell us that austerity for the government was making those who had the least pay the biggest price. So we have people who commit benefit fraud. Usually we are talking about pounds, doing it often to feed their children or to put the lights on. And we are chasing those down. And yet in tax evasion and avoidance, which runs to billions and billions of pounds, people are being let off the hook at a time we need money more than ever before. So the government's austerity approach slash jobs, but then completely reverse the type of things we need in this society. So we have a woeful social security system when we need one like we've never had before. And we have a woeful tax system that is not getting in the revenue that people should be paying at the top end, whether that is billionaires, corporation tax, uh, or whatever else it might be. Now, at the same time that the government has done that, it has slashed wages in the civil service, it has slashed pensions, and we now have a smaller civil service than at any time since the Second World War. It's increased slightly since the European referendum, but it's still much smaller. <clears throat> so in HMRC alone, 
we have 12,000 workers, key workers, on the national minimum wage. In DWP, at one stage, we had 40% of the workforce were so poorly paid, they had to claim the benefit that they administered. So what we see under a decade of austerity is public services on the wane, provision for people who need it being attacked, the workers who deliver it, their conditions attacked and their numbers slashed. At the same time, we've seen a record amount of privatization of functions that means at the moment, people we all now see as key workers, the cleaners, the security guards, the caterers, the people who do all that work that people often ignore. Primarily, they're in the private sector on poverty wages. And we've recently seen, if it wasn't for the union, people cleaning government offices, if they went sick, were told they'd have to survive on 19 pounds, 71 pence a day statutory sick pay. The union was successful in campaigning that those workers got 100% of sick pay from day one. So what we can see here is our austerity was used to denude public service and attack the workforce. And I think we have to assume, even though there are some who think this government is different to the government of Margaret Thatcher, I always assume the worst. And I actually think we have to assume the government is going to come for us to have to pay the price. So we have rumours of pay freezes that are impending, rumours of huge public spending cuts in the autumn round. So I think what we have to do in the way that Dave talked about is unite the interests of workers by arguing to drive up pay, pension level, job security, bring people back into the public sector who are outsourced to give them decent terms and conditions. But we have to ally that with a call to improve the public services we deliver. And this is what I really wanted to, to, to turn and conclude with. So that means uniting the service users and the taxpayers with the workers who deliver the service. So here's an example of that in, in, in real terms. Uh, tomorrow, the government will insist for political motives to reopen job centres to the public. The DWP know that's not safe. We actually think that one of the offices they intended to open tomorrow was in Leicester. We've all seen what's happened in Leicester today. At the same time, they are forcing workers to work in unsafe conditions they've reintroduced benefit sanctions. So we have a situation now where 2 million people claiming universal credit for the first time will now realize how many hoops they have to jump through in order to get benefits. And if they don't do it, they will find that their benefits are sanctioned and financial support is removed. So my vision, CAD, is that what we have to do in uniting the trade union movement and a much broader set of campaigns is to link rights for workers with better public services, to actually say to the government that when it talks about moving jobs out of London, which it's about to start talking about again, it's no good moving jobs from London to Manchester. That is a good thing in one way, but we want to look at Wigan, we want to look at Preston, we want to look at Blackpool, we want to look at Exeter and Torquay. We want regeneration to not just be about cities, but it has to be the communities which the public sector has withdrawn from en masse over the last uh, 10 to 20 years. And my vision therefore is like Dave, a fighting trade union movement that is prepared to take up the reins, to get over the threshold of the anti-union laws, try to get those removed, but whilst we have them to ensure we can organize to beat them, but to make sure that what we do is to say in fighting for rights for our members, we're also fighting for jobs on the high street in the towns and villages, as well as the cities outside of London. We are fighting for not just more jobs, but to deliver a proper social security system that is founded on the beverage principles, not one that penalizes the poorest. And we are fighting to link the issue of more jobs in public service to chasing down the tax dodgers to give us the money we need to invest in a better society and better conditions for everyone. And I think that means a union movement that is confident quite militant and prepared to get on the front foot. And it means embracing meetings like tonight and technology and younger people to assure them that these are not just trade unions fighting just for their members, important as that is, but we are fighting for a better society moving forward. And that's, I think, our challenge coming out of the pandemic. It's a huge challenge, but it's one we need to rise to. 
That's great. Thanks very much for that, Mark. It's a theme that has come up across a number of our events, and that theme is harnessing the anger and frustration that is out there and bringing the community and the different organisations together so that we can be the proper force that we can be, given the numbers that we are. So thanks very much for that. As, um, there's already questions coming up, so I'm sure that we'll get round to them. I see now that Lydia is back. And um, sorry for your troubles with your um, sound, but let's hope it all goes well. So Lydia, I was saying, Professor of Law, I won't do the introduction again. I have introduced you, Lydia, and told everybody who you are and showed them copies of your uh, wonderful book. I'm not sure whether you heard my question. doesn't really matter. I'm sure you'll say what it is that you want to say. So welcome to Lydia. Hi. Um, are you hearing me okay? Yeah. Ah, oh, fabulous. Right. Coronavirus, it's killed thousands of people unnecessarily. Let's be honest about that. And it's the UK's response to coronavirus, which is the major cause of those deaths. And when I say response, I'm not talking about Boris Johnson going AWOL for a few weeks in February, although obviously that's an issue, or whether or not Dominic Cummings sits on stage. I'm talking about our national collective response of the UK calling into question our capacity to respond and the collective resources that we have from which we've been able to muster that response. It's, we simply have not been up to the task. And I want to start by acknowledging the premise of this meeting, which is that trade unions engage with a Conservative government that they demand to be heard now. And I welcome that because trade unions need to be involved and on the front foot and like Mark says, taking up the reins now. And if trade unions aren't able to provide representation and engage working people, there is a real risk of some very dark consequences in terms of social cohesion. Um, I've been conducting research about social care and links between the quality of employment and the quality of care and this research has taken place in the context of the pandemic. Um, we partnered with trade unions, Unison and the GMB and analysed survey data from two and a half thousand care workers from over a thousand different workplaces. And the data revealed many breaches of health and safety law, lack of PPE. We found eight in 10 care workers believed that they wouldn't receive any wages if they needed to self-isolate. Uh, in the context of the miserable £95.85 a week, many had a considerable fear of poverty and said that they just could not afford to self-isolate. And so this lack of occupational sick pay is effectively forcing care workers to work and it is one of the factors that has increased the risk of coronavirus transmission. We've made three recommendations, and while they pertain to the care sector, I think you're going to easily see their general applicability to many, many other industrial situations. So first of all, that the government step in to guarantee average wages as sick pay for care workers. This is about the failure to treat people with decency at work and the unavailability of very basic standards at work is a matter of public health. Secondly, for care workers to be put into problem solving roles at local and national government level, because there are clearly gaps in knowledge at policy level about what happens in care settings and the role and functions of care workers. And by involving care workers in decision making, by calling on them as advisors, fewer mistakes would have been made. For example, about PPE use and getting PPE where it's needed and how staff were being de 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 deployed. And this lack of involvement of working people in policy making and decision making throughout the public sector across the economy, it has cost lives because workers embedded knowledge is considered worthless. They have no voice and we have no suitable system of democracy because trade unions aren't recognised as partners within the democratic fabric of the UK. And thirdly, we've asked for a review of the decision to suspend routine inspection of care providers by the sector regulators. Um, so inspection by the regulators was suspended on the 16th of March. So there has been no formal recording of what's been happening in care homes during these terrible times. And in general, 
there is an absence of inspection and regulation in the employment market in, in, in the actions of employers. Think about the virtual invisibility of the health and safety executive. Employers have been just allowed to get on with it. Managerial prerogative is privileged over transparency and inspection and accountability um, about publicly debated norms around protections at work and the behavior of corporations. And it's important to understand the structural problems that the government is confronting as they're trying to navigate some kind of response to coronavirus. Privatization. The, public se the private sector's role in social care is entrenched. There are no centralized levers of control and that is the way the system is designed to be. The political sense consensus has been to establish a care system based on a market, and care services are largely regulated through the market mechanisms. So when we had the inspection by the rapporteur um, Philip Alston from the United Nations reporting to the Human Rights Council, he said that local authorities have abandoned their responsibilities by relegating key services to the private sector and that people had been abandoned to the private markets in relation to services that affect every dimension of their basic well-being without access to minimum standards and incompatibility with human rights. So we need to think about violation of rights and the design of the system and about accountability. Why has the system been designed in this way? It's been done to reduce labour costs and we are now reaping the whirlwind. And that's why sexual collective bargaining is so important. In the marketplace for social care in England alone, there are 30,000 different registered care providers. There are 1.2 million workers in the NHS. There are 2 million workers in adult social care. Creating a care system in which all those 2 million workers are going to be employed by the public sector is such a mammoth task. It is unimaginable for me as a trade unionist and an expert in labour law and care. What we need to publicly campaign and argue for, I believe, is the right to coordinate the sector publicly, openly, democratically. And we need to assert that care isn't a private matter. It's the business of all of us. And the best way to achieve that is through sectoral collective bargaining for the care sector at a national level in which care workers are respected as equals at the bargaining table and trade unions are respected as essential within a democratic UK. And that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks very much for that, Lydia, uh, for highlighting the problems uh, that we're facing and reminding us that it's not just us who complain about these things all the time, um, that the, our failures are recognised internationally um, by bodies that oversee or comment on the situation. Thanks very much for that. Um, I'm going to move on to our next and actually final speaker, uh, and that is um, Matt Rack. Matt is, as you'll know, the General Secretary of the FBU, the Fire Brigade Union. Thanks for joining us, Matt. I know you're busy. Um, generally, your members, uh, you're always on the front line, um, always in danger of uh, not returning home from work. That's the problems your members face. What has austerity and cuts meant to your service? And how has that been reflected in this crisis, Matt? Thanks very much, Cad, and uh, thanks, comrades, for coming along to this discussion. Um, there's lots of, uh, obviously, online discussions taking place, uh, and there's lots we can learn from, from how we use this technology. There's, there's a lot of downsides to it, but there's a lot of upsides as well, which I think the, the union movement uh, and the left needs to learn from. I think for us, uh, there is some... Uh, uh, we, we're in an industry that deals as part of our day-to-day -day life with emergencies, uh, and one thing I would uh, we've made from clear from the start is you don't uh, plan for emergencies when they happen. You plan for emergencies in advance. That's the whole point of, of actually you couldn't run a fire service if you just made it up as you go along. And I think what lies behind many of the failings in terms of the British government's uh, response to COVID-19 is a complete failure to plan and there are political reasons behind that. So in the Fire and Rescue Service we have two 
uh, areas, in particular in, in England, they're called integrated risk management plans. That's how fire services are supposed to plan. There's lots of failings in this, by the way, but that's what, in theory, what they're supposed to do, plan for all the risks in their community. They're called different things in different parts of the UK. But the idea is you assess the risk and you draw up a plan about how you mitigate that risk, how you plan to reduce it uh, or tackle it if, if uh, fires or other emergencies happen. But at a national level, so that's within the fire service, uh, and in our view, um, fire services should have been planning for a pandemic. But then if you look at other legislation that covers uh, public services, we have, for example, the Civil Contingencies Act, which makes clear that public bodies should be planning to take uh, action in the event of various risks. And the government, uh, since the introduction of that in 2004 has produced a national risk register uh, which highlights areas of risk facing communities and of course as now as is, is, is out in the press one of those has been the threat of a pandemic so the idea that this has come as a shot out of the blue uh, is completely untrue the risk of a pandemic has been known has been known for more than a decade at least uh, and what the Civil Contingencies Act requires uh, Category 1 responders, which includes the fire service, but it also includes local government, health and other public agencies, it requires them to plan for how they would deal with that national level of threat. And that means things like planning for precisely PPE, planning for things like what will happen if your staff numbers are reduced because of sickness, because of, in this case, self-isolation, all these things are the sorts of issues which uh, a civilized and sensible society would be planning for. And it is therefore a, a huge indictment of a failure of government policy at Westminster and indeed across the UK uh, for that uh, public agencies and central government have failed to do that, uh, that planning. And of course, the, the, the problem is that we've seen, just as in industry, we've seen a shift from uh, just-in-case production to just-in-time production, we see the same approach in public services because planning for risk is costly. You have to plan for what happens if this particular risk happens because, of course, the, the possibility is that the risk does not materialise, in which case, according to some people, you've wasted your money by planning for that risk. It's interesting that they never take that approach when it comes to nuclear weapons. They're happy to throw billions and billions of pounds of taxpayers' money at nuclear weapons. Uh, and obviously, we all hope that they are never used because that risk never does uh, materialise. Um, so we've seen that shift in, in public services in the UK as well. And then on top of that, we've seen, so I think that failure to plan um, has been there for some considerable time, but it has been exacerbated considerably by austerity. Uh, and you can see that in a number of, um, on a number of fronts. Uh, if we take health service, you compare the number of um, um, uh, beds in hospitals to elsewhere in Europe, you can see that Britain performs very poorly in that regard. If you take my own uh, service, the Fire and Rescue Service, small part of public services, but we've seen uh, 12,000 jobs go over the past decade. Uh, that's approaching 20 to 25 percent of, uh, of frontline firefighters. At the start of COVID, we began to discuss with our employers and they were planning to uh, what would they do if they saw staff reductions and they said well we could see staff reductions of up to 20 or 25 percent and we pointed out well, that's exactly the number that you have cut over the past decade under austerity but we've seen that in all public services as well and then the same failing is reflected as has been touched on in the uh, inability at central government level to deal with uh, urgent issues such as PPE and testing and it was obvious to us from the start that if you have a system of uh, key workers where you ask millions of people to stay at home and not go to work but you also ask another 
group of workers to go to work, you clearly are putting that, that group of workers at additional risk. And therefore, the question of provision of PPE is an obvious one, but also the co provision of testing of that key group of work, that those key workers is an obvious point that should have been identified right at the start and, in fact, should have been built into, into uh, planning. Um, and as a result of this, we've seen that uh, workers have borne the brunt of the COVID crisis. Um, I think uh, just something about tra the position of trade unions. One, I think, um, positive lesson for trade unionism and collective bargaining is our, our own experience during the pandemic. Because interestingly, we have, um, we, we took measures with our employers immediately to reduce unnecessary contact with the public. So fire safety inspections were reduced, educational activities were reduced and so on. But we also discussed um, additional functions that the fire service may take on. Uh, and we did this by means of a tripartite discussion involving the union, the fire service employers from across the UK and the National Fire Chiefs Council. Uh, it was done collectively through effectively a form of collective bargaining. And it meant that we have signed now some 14 agreements for firefighters to undertake additional work. And it, you know, some of this is very somber stuff, such as the movement, the mass movement of uh, bodies, uh, assisting ambulance uh, services in driving uh, ambulances, uh, the care homes were mentioned, uh, uh, pr provision of training in the use of PPE to care home staff, a whole series of areas where the expertise of our members has been able to be brought to use in relation to tackling COVID. And the value which I think we need to hammer home to government is we've been able to do this precisely because we have high levels of trade union membership and we've got strong structures of collective bargaining. That means we've got a national framework, uh, we've got risk assessment built into the process from the start, and that means that when, it, when those agreements arrive at local level, local union officials can have confidence in it, but also members who then volunteer for any of those 14 activities can have confidence that their union has endorsed this, that risk and uh, safety have been built into the process from the start, and we've had thousands of our members have volunteered to do additional activities over the past four months as a result of that agreement. I think it's a very positive example of what collective bargaining can achieve and the role of unions in these uh, circumstances. Uh, however, despite that, um, I do think that we're, face, we're gonna face some uh, very sharp challenges. Uh, we hear a lot of bluster from the Prime Minister about uh, no return to austerity. I have to say, I think uh, my fear is that we see precisely a return to austerity, while at the same time he says he's not delivering austerity, because unfortunately the lessons of history suggest that that's precisely what the system does. They, they clearly have incurred huge bills. Uh, there are huge problems in terms of tax in intake. Uh, we've seen some of the economic figures over the uh, details over the past couple of days so the economy faces huge challenges uh, and we've seen the leaked documents from the treasury as has been referred to talking about effectively austerity too and further pay freezes so we have some really real challenges and i think we we need to start first of all by shouting about the role of unions in terms of it is workers who have seen society through this crisis workers in our public services. Well, I, thought, I think we've also got an opportunity to cut across the nasty divisions which uh, the, the press and government try to create between public and private sector workers because it's also private sector workers who've been key to this in food production, food preparation, in delivery, in, in retail and so on, uh, as well as those of us working in, in public services. We need to build an alliance between public and private sector workers. And we need to say, as COVID begins to ease, as hopefully it will, although there are fears obviously of, of further spikes, uh, that actually we want justice for those key workers who have seen society through the, the past uh, three, four months. Uh, and we want justice for trade unions and we want recognition uh, and to turn some of the bluster 
from uh, the central government into real changes of direction. Uh, and as other speakers have said, that, that is a huge challenge because uh, we face a very, sh uh, a very clear uh, majority for Johnson. Uh, nevertheless, some, uh, some points of weakness in terms of that they clearly want to, they've got the so-called red wall seats where they sit, clearly want to try and maintain some support. Yeah. Uh, whether that means they want to launch major attacks on trade unions remains to be seen. But the better organised we are, then uh, the better we, we will be able to, to resist those attacks. Um, just as a final uh, warning, uh, we, we've just heard in the past couple of days, the Mayor of London, and again, unfortunately, a Labour Mayor, a warning of significant cuts to the London Fire Brigade as a result to a crisis in finances in the, in the, in the GLA family. Uh, that, if you like, gives us a warning of, of what Austerity 2 might look like. And it's, uh, we all have to work together, campaign together, fight together to, to uh, defeat those uh, sort, of, sort of attacks. So thanks very much. Yeah, thanks very much for that, Matt. Uh, a wide-ranging uh, view of uh, some of the problems. And yes, you're perfectly right. We know the warning signs are all there about how they're going to come for us to pay um, so that they can bury their money tree yet again. Um, now, there's loads of questions in the chat box that I'm going to go to, but I just wanted to ask one of our audience, a man who is a... Uh, who has, who has a vision of a progressive role that the state can play. Uh, Mr. MacDonald, I see that you're there and listening. Um, John is someone who has spent his life working with trade unions um, and he has spent his time promoting the role of trade unions in collective bargaining and uh, sees what we can and what we can't do. John MacDonald, I wondered if you wanted to just say a few words before I go to chat box. I don't want to get accused of gate crashing, um, Chad. Okay. Zoom bombing. <laughs> I just wanted to, I just wanted to hear the discussion because I've got another meeting to go to as well. Um, because the reality is, with the potential of a general election four years off, the role of um, defending our communities and promoting um, alternative programs to enable us to. I suppose, come out of the pandemic with some semblance of a thriving economy in, in due course is going to fall on the trade unions. And the most important thing now is having a, a mass mobilisation of the trade union movement around a, an economic programme which looks to the long term, but also defends in the short term. And it's exactly what each of the, the speakers have, have said. The, today, um, with Boris Johnson's attempt to portray himself as Roosevelt. Um, Roosevelt must be spinning in his grave, I should think, at the moment, because it was complete damp squib on the scale of expenditure. And as others have pointed out, most of the um, expenditure that he's announced today as um, re-announcements of um, past projects that they haven't delivered upon. So I think we just have to take uh, not just... Um, a pinch of salt with what he's got is absolute disbelief. And the point that others have made, um, the Johnson has said today that they're not returning to austerity. We will not use that word. He might not use the word, but in reality they are. And I think they don't, for example, they don't tr treat uh, wage freezes or wage cuts as austerity. They simply would think we're just talking about cuts in services. And I think what we'll see is the imposition of wage freezes yet again. And we will see austerity by stealth. And the, we can see already, Matt's already said in, on the fire service in London, now there are threats of cuts already. And we'll see that across the piece, but it will be by stealth. They'll deny it's happening, but it, but it will be happening. There will be fiscal stimulus. There's no doubt about it. They, there's a large number of senior Tories egged on and lobbied by big business and corporations for a continuation of fiscal stimulus, but it will be fiscal stimulus with a selfish purpose. They're all Keynesians now when it comes, when it comes to looking after themselves. And it will be a fiscal stimulus to restore profit, but not to restore wage levels. And it won't be one in which uh, we have a fair taxation system to pay for our public services. I think we've got battles ahead. Um, I think constructive negotiation exactly as David said engage wherever we can to negotiate the best deals we possibly can but that will 
those deals will only be secured on the basis of demonstrating a collective strength. That's the first thing I've got to say. The second thing is we do have to start being confident about being able to develop a, a political and economic program for the future. We've got to claim the future now rather than allow them to do it. Forget about the la their language of inventions of new deals, etc. I think what we've got to do, as I say, is claim the future, bring forward an alternative economic strategy that the trade union and labor movement as a whole can get behind, that we can build upon and recruit membership to our unions to enable, to, as a result of that, but also to develop an alternative economic strategy that will eventually, whoever is subsequently elected, will, be, will uh, I think, will be empowered to implement. So it is that work that, that we've got to undertake. And I think we need to do it with a bit of confidence as well, um, because actually, if, uh, if the coming period is going to prove anything. I think for many people coming out of this pandemic, it is the, the need for collective action and for a strong voice for working people. So I'm, despite um, the difficulties that we've gone through, I'm confident we can use the movement now as the lever for change within our society. But as I say, it requires an element of solidarity. Tad, I've, I've, um, I've Zoom bombed or whatever you call it enough, Marvin. Right, yeah, that's great. Thanks, John. Lovely to see you again. Uh, right, I'm going to take some questions and comments from the chat box. I'll read out a few of them and then I'll ask our speakers. You don't have to answer every single question that we raise, but you can pick and choose maybe one or other uh, and we'll go from there um, and see how we get on with time. So um, I've got one from Raquel Jess who says, when discussing the role of unions to build society and the economy, how do we, as a labour movement, fight for all workers, especially migrant workers, undocumented workers and workers of colour? So that's one, looking after migrant workers. Uh, I've got one from Pete Middleman. Uh, what role can the movement play in providing the type of political education to working people, both unionised and non-unionised? Uh, which helps the unengaged to rationalise the economic brutality that they're struggling from. So there's two. Um, I've got one from Mick Antonio, who is involved in the Welsh Government. Uh, they are currently drafting a social partnership bill to ensure trade unions and workers are at the forefront. Uh, and he says, how do you envisage engaging with devolved governments uh, in the promotion of trade union rights. Uh, I'll, I'll pick out one more and then we'll see how we get on with them. Um, we've got one from Phil McGarry who says, uh, what is our strategy within the TUC to campaign against the massive job losses and to name and shame those employers who are using the pandemic to uh, change contracts of employment and employ people on um, worse terms and conditions of service. So wide ranging uh, number of issues covered there. As I say, don't feel the need to answer all of them, but I'm sure each one of you have got something to contribute. So Dave. Um, yeah, I want to pick up on, on the point about migrant workers and I suppose linking it to the, I think the other point was, you know, how do we deal with campaigns like Black Lives Matter. Uh, and this is something that I think the trade union movement has to take responsibility for. So, so one of the things that, that we've sort of looked at here is, is how do we take these debates into the workplace? Um, you know, we we want to talk to our members. We did a session the other week. First time we've done this. We, we've got good engagement levels with our members online. We've built that up over a period of time. And we decided to have a, a discussion with the members about the Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. campaign. And we linked it to, you know, the, the reality of struggles of all workers. Uh, and we created that debate in, in a way that was, you know, I think a lot of our people, I'm going to be honest with you, was, was a bit nervous about that, um, about doing it. Because, you know, it did expose amongst our membership and some views online in chatbots and things like that were, were, were unacceptable. Um, but the answer to this is, is that trade unions cross every divide in society. We are the organisations that do that. We can be the unifying voice 
um, for all workers. I mean, that's an obvious statement. But we have to link our work um, and not outsource that work um, to other campaigning groups. We've got to take responsibility for that and we've got to do it in the workplace. Um, so, you know, I think that's important. An interesting thing about education, and, you know, we're, we're doing some stuff at the moment where we're talking to all of our, what we call our central service departments within the union, uh, and we're starting to challenge each department on what is the proactive agenda that's going to link into organising workers, recruiting workers, um, and, uh, you know, the concept of a new deal, and I'll take John's point uh, about, you know, what Boris Johnson has, has called it now, taken out our clothes, effectively, we've got to deal with that. So there's an army of union learning reps um, that the trade union movement has built up for a long time. And why, why don't we take that army out into communities? Why don't we think collectively about how the, the work that they do um, in terms of, you know, support and education in workplaces, uh, why can't we take that, that group out to some of these community areas um, and, and organise some of the real education that we need and engage with young people, with, with all parts of communities? So, I mean, that's an area we can look at. Um, I, I think the key question here is what is the umbrella that connects us all? And how we figure that out and allow enough flexibility underneath that umbrella for all of the campaigns that we've all spoken about tonight to be connected is the key thing. And we've got to get on the front foot on all of these issues. Question. Thanks for that, Dave. Uh, Mark? So, um, I, I, mean, I, agree with, I agree very much with the points Dave made. Um, three things I'd say. Firstly, on migrant workers, um, I think we have to show a degree of humility. I mean, I, I think two of the unions who is record on fighting for migrant workers are ones many unions stay clear of because they don't affiliate to the TUC and that's the United Voices Union and the IWGB. Mm -hmm. we, we have come across them and actually have worked quite closely with them recently in government. Um, and I think we can learn quite a lot from their ability to get in, talk to migrant workers, in a way that makes it quite clear that what they want to do is take pretty quick and decisive action in order to benefit those workers and they've had some stunning victories and in government departments we have not only picked up some stuff from them but it's enabled us to do things better and the dispute that we had in base that was for privatized contractor workers who were cleaners and caterers security guards um, then that was a successful campaign and I know that our reps on the ground work quite closely with their counterparts in other unions so I think you have to get in there and you have to be prepared to recognize that organizing these workers isn't always about getting union numbers in and the union itself just seeing that as you know as extra revenue it's sometimes recognizing you've got to get into places be seen and help win some battles. The second point on a TUC strategy that Phil asked I don't want to be contentious, but I think if we do not learn from our mistakes in the decade of austerity, then there won't be much hope. And I have often said it, and I get into hot water sometimes, but when history is written, the union's record in battling against austerity is not a great one. There's been some exceptions and some great victories, but we did not work in coordination enough. We didn't seek to make common cause enough when common cause was there to be made. And many unions got picked off one by one, and we actually saw huge devastation. We cannot repeat that mistake, and we have to turn the Congress resolutions into reality. That means less interunion competition, less people perhaps just thinking about their own union and actually thinking about the movement benefiting as a whole. And that leads me to my final point, which is in learning those lessons, and this links a bit to, Phil's, uh, to Pete's point about trade union education, um, I'll be honest, the biggest weakness I think of our movement, and I, I'll put my hands up and say this is as, in PCS as much as many other unions, right, is that the hollowing out and the attacks that we faced have meant that not only have our numbers halved since 1979, but actually the key thing for us is the participation levels and engagement of rank and file union members 
is very low in some of our organizations. Our activist cadre is doing an incredible job. They've taken a real battering, but in many unions, the activist cadre is much older, much whiter, and much more male than the membership that we actually represent. Um, and in terms of participation, what the union ballot thresholds threw up is that is a challenge if you cannot get over 50%. And we've tried twice and got incredibly close. Had the highest strike vote in our union's history, but fell agonizingly close. Dave obviously is in a union that has actually smashed those thresholds. But the key is participation. And what I think that means is de-bureaucratizing our own structures and getting the message across. Our union reps are fantastic and doing a great job. But we all have to encourage new people coming on and getting involved and not see that as a threat, but as an absolute opportunity. And I think there's lots of work to be done. Uh, and, and to me, that is a bit about de-bureaucratizing, getting new people involved in any capacity they're prepared to do. And as Dave has said, then turning all that participation outwards to engage in workplace struggle, yes, but into the community to link these battles. Three big things, but if we did all of them right, we would win these battles coming up. But if we don't do any of them, we could well suffer some of the defeats that we saw in the last 10 years. Thanks very much for that, Mark. Um, Lydia, I know that you've experience of working with devolved uh, government. So... Well, yeah, I wanted to pick up on, the, on, on Mick Antony's point in, in relation to Wales, because um, when, when I've been talking about trade unions and the state, not just talking about the public sector, but actually about the structural role and function of trade unions. And um, that is something that we must not lose sight of because what has been revealed to the public around coronavirus has been about structural problems and we need structural solutions to those problems. And what's interesting is that in Wales, there has been a concerted attempt to try within the limitations of devolved competence because devolved governments don't have the ability to create legislation with the primary purpose of addressing industrial relations or employment issues. Nevertheless, there has been a concerted political will to try and address some of the structural problems where trade unions have been shut out and what I think is particularly interesting with coronavirus is that the structural problems in relation to employment have been revealed and exposed as health and public health issues. And as health issues, as care issues, these are areas where the devolved governments of Wales and Scotland do have competence. So if we address issues, we look at issues like sick pay as a public health issue, what does that mean as far as the competence of the devolved governments, where there is political will? How can the, 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 the legal um, mechanisms be created in order to maximise the opportunities that exist? And I think if it's possible for us to move forward in social care around sexual bargaining, it would be such an important statement of what the trade unions could do and where the trade unions ought to be. And I think it's possible for that to be achieved um, within Wales, within Scotland, uh, but particularly within Wales, where we have this political interest and political will. And I really think it would be fantastic if there was more support from the trade unions at a UK level for what is tried to be achieved in, in Wales. So speaking up for little Wales, it's uh, important what's happening there. Mixed work is important. Mixed work is important and the Institute has been working in Wales as well as in Scotland to see if we can start setting a few uh, markers down about where we should get. If we can't win it here, let's see what we can win in other nations of the, of the country. Uh, Matt, over to you. Yeah, a few quick points. I'll just on picking up on the, de uh, the um, devolved government's point, uh, we work across the UK and I think it is, it is sharply noticeable the cultural differences in relation to engagement with trade unions outside of England uh, is very it's, it, for us it's very very noticeable when you go to Wales when you go to Scotland and indeed when you go to Northern Ireland there is much less hostility 
to unions, union organisation and uh, uh, collective bargaining. And, and that is very, and we have, I think we have to try and take advantage of that and use it to, to our advantage. I remember, you know, I, I gave a presentation to the Northern Ireland Assembly once, and it is bizarre to see people uh, across the spectrum in the Northern Ireland Assembly come jumping in to sing their praises of the Fire Brigade Union and support us, in that case, on, on a pensions issue, which, where we got nowhere with the Westminster government. It is, uh, so I think the, the, we do need to think very carefully about that. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, picking up a couple of, of points that have been, already been touched on, on, um, on, on a, a point that Mark made about uh, the, the state of the unions and how we try to uh, rebuild, I think, uh, the, the issue, of course, there has been a, a very significant decline in trade union membership levels, uh, largely as a result of deindustrialization. But I think alongside that, there has been, I think, a weakening of the strength of workplace based organization. And I think that's something that not enough attention is paid to. So we, we have, I, I'd say, I'm not picking out any sector or union or whatever, we have areas where there are people who may be members of a trade union, but they are not necessarily organised in the workplace. And it's something we spend a lot of time thinking about because our structure is workplace-based. Our structure is where our branch is the workplace. So our branch secretary and other unions would be called a shop steward. We call them branch secretaries because they're based in a fire station. I think it is a, a good model um, and I don't think we will see a, a revival of trade unionism unless we also see a revival of workplace based organization. Uh, and so I think that's, it's, uh, it's probably something that's sometimes a bit uncomfortable for general secretaries because general secretaries like to be at the top talking to ministers and so on. Actually, unless we're building on the ground in the workplace, it's all building on sand. You know, the Tories will talk to us uh, at the end of the day. What they won't do is take any notice of us unless they think we've got a uh, strong uh, organisation that can deliver. And that ties in with Mark's point about how do you defeat the, the trade union uh, ballot thresholds and so on. You only defeat it by being, being well organised in the workplace. And I think, again, touching not from that on the question of education, I think there's some interesting debates in trade union education about what... Uh, and it's interesting, I think sometimes political differences come out in unusual ways. And I think one of the tensions there is between people who think our job is simply to train people. How do you train people to to represent someone in a discipline or grievance? Or certainly what our approach more is about education. You, you educate people to be working class activists and to have a broad outlook on the world, think for themselves, because we think that gives them the, the, the politics to organize themselves and organize their their work makes for for change uh, industrially and politically so i think uh, and there are all sorts of tensions i think in in tuc education around these issues particularly with the drive to move towards more and more uh, online frankly sometimes tick box education versus actually face to face uh, it might be online classrooms, but where people are actually engaging and discussing with their workmates or, or people in other unions. And then just, I think, I think that does lead into the question of finally coming back to migrant workers, I think is an absolutely huge uh, issue. Uh, and, you know, whatever, wherever people stood on the question of Brexit, clearly migration was an issue in the Brexit referendum. And it is uh, something of a running sore. And we've seen a, a growth of anti-migrant feeling in the UK over, over recent years. And we have to be at the forefront of challenging it. I think the history shows that migrant workers have produced some of the most militant fighters in the history of our movement. Uh, and we have to build on those traditions today. But I think that means we do have to tackle, um, we have to tackle uh, prejudice and division within our own organisations and within our own movements. And I think the trade union movement is well placed uh, to to achieve that if we take it on uh, and it's not easy but we we do we do need to uh, we do need to make that central uh, and I you know I, I build on the positives I think that the the international eruption of the black light around black lives matter has been inspiring um, and I think just one one little bit of, of I, I think if you look at the the footage from the United States 
uh, and compare it with, for example, the aftermath of the assassination of Martin Luther King, I think one thing that stands out to me is the multiracial and multi-ethnic uh, sense that you have in those demonstrations across much of the United States. I think that's a hugely positive thing but also is reflected in many of the European uh, protests we've seen, including here in Britain as well. Thanks for that, Matt. Well, um, there is lots more issues and questions and comments on the chat box. Um, all I can say is that they, along with the video of tonight, will be on the Institute's website soon. You're quite right. Um, what we first need to do is mobilise within our own union. Uh, as somebody has said in the chat box, um, you know, things like returns in elections, internal elections are very low. That's partly because of anti-trade union legislation. If we moved away from postal ballots and into electronic ballots, then we might get a better turnout. But it's also about mobilising through the communities and community organisations. I see, for instance, Sheffield needs a pay rises in the audience tonight and their work around um, the impact of universal credit has been outstanding. Last night we did a Zoom with uh, Laura Pidcock and the work that they've been doing with the People's Assembly is, is great mobilising and getting people together. We need to not only mobilise people but also give them something to mobilise along, along around and I think some of the ideas out tonight of fill some of those gaps. So can I say thanks to the speakers for attending and for your contribution. I know you're all very busy and it's marvellous to see you. Uh, the Institute is always pleased to act as an umbrella organisation so anything we can do to bring everything together we will uh, be happy to do. Um, audience if you like this Zoom uh, then please sign up for our newsletter. It will be on the slide that's coming up next. Um, and you will get information direct to your inbox about advance warning about things like these. Um, the next meeting, our next meeting is on transitioning to a sustainable and greener economy. Uh, that's in about two weeks time and that's got Anne Pettifer and Steve Turner and others on. The date's not yet confirmed so sign up to the newsletter to make sure that you don't uh, miss it. So. Thank you to our speakers, thank you to our audience, thank you to support for the Institute and we look forward to seeing you at our next event.